Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who is here despite some severe lower back pain. <laughs> it's Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello, yeah. I was sent for an MRI. They checked me out. Uh, <laughs> nothing came up, but it still hurts. So uh, I'm powering through, though. And I'm to be fair through. to Bobby Wood, you do your job sitting down. That's very true. And that, those new chairs have pretty good lumbar support. They really do. That's the key That's the key component here. Yeah. Is maybe if the jet that I assume was being chartered for him to fly <laughs> to US training camp, maybe if it had better lumbar support. Yeah. Yeah. Or if Bundesliga centre backs had lumbar support and you could just lean against them. Yeah, or if you weren't in a relegation <laughs> battle, question mark. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna be talking MLS yep. uh, later on mm-hmm. today, our MLS review. But we'll also we've also got to talk about changes to the US men's national team roster. We must. Previously on the Total Soccer Show, <laughs> yeah. we brought you the news of Fabian Johnson. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was injured, I think a thigh muscle injury. Fabi had to pull out of the squad, and mm-hmm. um, we speculated on who might replace him. And obviously Bruce Arena waited until we hit publish on that podcast <laughs> to name. Graham Zussi yeah. as the replacement for Fabian Johnson. Mm-hmm. So before we get to the uh, the more recent changes, yeah. let's start there. Sure. Left mid for a right back? You, well, see, that's the thing. I think it's it's maybe a mistake to see this as like a like-for-like like replacement. Uh-huh. I think some people have thought that maybe this indicated that Fabian Johnson was going to be playing right back or was getting mm-hmm. looks at right back. I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think Bruce Arena is practical, and mm-hmm. I think he's basically looking at his roster and thinking, what do I need to do to reinforce because I have these openings? Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe he thinks my midfield is okay the way it is, we still have depth there, but I want to bring in one more defender just yeah, yeah. in case. And I also think, like, uh, so Bruce Arena, like any coach, mm-hmm. is not perfect, right? right? He may have made the... Have you ever done that thing where you, like... You buy something, then a day later you're like, "Oh, maybe I shouldn't have bought that. I should uh, maybe return that." Have I ever done? Have I ever done that, or have I ever not done it? <laughs> yes, I do that all the time. So he may have named this roster with like Jeff Cameron and Michael yep. Orozco as his options at right back, and then essentially had uh, yeah. Pickers regret, mm-hmm. <laughs> U.S. national team coach, squad selector regret. And when he had the opportunity to bring in Graham Zuzzi when Fabian Johnson was injured, he's like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have done that to begin with. Yeah. You know what I mean? I kept the receipt. I can <laughs> I can now name Zuzi to the roster. Or maybe he remembered that Sporting KC existed. Yeah, maybe that maybe that's it. <laughs> well, to some extent, maybe not like maybe more so like look at like, like the back four of Sporting KC. You remember they exist. Yeah. So yeah, because the other thing that I happened, like that you just implied that two players make up all sixty six percent of Sporting KC. <laughs> no, of the Americans, <laughs> the see. US national team eligible. Um uh, and you can add Dom Dwyer to the list now, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe. That you um, can. So also over the weekend, mm-hmm. Bobby Wood, as we sort of alluded to in the intro, um, pulled out of the national team yeah. with lower, severe lower back pain mm-hmm. and was replaced by um, kind of Matt Beasler, but also Sasha Cleston. Yeah. And actually, Sasha Cleston is the more obvious replacement and then Matt Beasler as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also puzzled by this. Yeah. W- which aspect are you puzzled by? All aspects or a couple specific ones? Well, let's say, okay, so Wood out, you would, mm-hmm. the natural thing would be, let's get another striker in. Mm-hmm. But instead, we get someone who's a little more withdrawn, more attacking midfielder type character, mm-hmm. Sasha Cleston. Right? right. So I can kind of see that because it's roughly similar. Mm-hmm. Except maybe, that, maybe you've got Dempsey, who's maybe yeah. is more likely to start, so you don't need another striker. Mm-hmm. Except that we watched Sasha Cleston play for the Red Bulls this weekend. Yeah. You could maybe argue that it's the formation that isn't doing him any favors. Right. But even on like set piece delivery, I thought he was not his usual self. Yeah. Whereas Benny Failhaber kind of tore it up this yep. weekend and well, was very impressive. We'll get to all that in the review, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. I would I would note that I believe when the announcement was made that Kleshton was replacing mm-hmm. Wood, it was before Kleshton's performance against Seattle. Mm-hmm. Right? Which yeah, which but it was after Benny Failhaber's goal for Sporting KC. Right. And so uh, <laughs> it's it's still a frustrating thing for me, at least personally, just that. I started the day watching footage and being like, okay, okay, things are looking better. Like, I can see why this is happening. And now I'm sort of back in that, like, is this that arena thing where he's calling in the people he likes as opposed to the people that maybe fit what the team is trying to do or what he wants to do with the team? And it just gives me a little bit of a pause for concern. Well, he might say those are the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, But there's also the old old sort of Bruce Arena complaint that he just trusts certain people and relies on certain players – too hard at the risk, like at the expense of bringing in fresher faces. Yeah, and and I think the key, and I think the key examples. phrase there, yeah, being too hard yeah. because. Trusting someone, relying on someone, knowing what they are capable of is yeah. a very good thing. But when you start to think, oh, they've got it, no problem, I'll look at everything else, and mm-hmm. you're not really critically evaluating that position or yeah. that potential vulnerability, yep. it can then become a real vulnerability. And right. that's the only thing that alarms me, is that it might be an example here of like, oh, Kleshton can handle it, yeah, he's had a bad start yeah. of the season, but we know in big games he'll pop up. Uh-huh. It's it's roughly the equivalent for me of like when we play, <laughs> this is a big reach, I apologize, people, that's but it's like roughly I'm, the I'm equivalent to it. of like playing CBSA, playing local soccer. Yeah. And it's a person who's been out of training, has been injured, hasn't been playing at all, and then they come in after two months and they're like, I'm ready to go. Yeah, Put yeah. me at center back. Put me at center mid. It's uh-huh. like, uh, should we though? Because I know you're very good. 
But on the other hand, you're kind of out of form, and I don't uh-huh. feel like maybe you're going to execute right away. Mm-hmm. Bruce Arena seems to think these guys will execute, and so it will be fine. Okay, and what about the Matt Beasley edition? Because that seemed like it mm-hmm. wasn't necessary. Like We already had, what, seven people who could play centre-back mm-hmm. on this roster, um, and he just took the opportunity to bring in Matt Beasley. Yeah, so now we have 25 on the roster, 10 of which are defenders. Yeah, literally. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. yeah and I think of those, like, seven are centre-backs, mm-hmm. like, first-choice centre-backs. So he can't have needed an extra centre-back. No. I can't imagine that. Uh, maybe, oh, maybe it's the John Brooks um, mm-hmm. MRI yeah. thing. So John Brooks, uh, for people who don't know, scored for Hertha Berlin mm-hmm. this weekend. Um, I haven't seen it. I'm going to assume with his head. Yeah, it was. It was a nice. Like, it was kind of <laughs> a. It? it was a powerful flicked on header. So yeah. it was like near post. I think from a corner, yeah. he wins it at the near post, puts it in side netting. Okay, a power mm-hmm. flick. Yep, that's what I'm going to yeah. call that. <laughs> a directional header, though, for sure. <laughs> but then was complaining about was it his knee? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or uh, Hertha Berlin were complaining about his knee yeah, for him, and they had him scanned and then cleared him to be released. So maybe this is like I maybe need another the left-sided center back yeah or is it i don't trust via fania and i'm a little worried about beasley so also let's get this guy can play left back or is it all of the above i think it might be all of the above yeah. maybe it's also just that you want defensive stability to the extent possible and mm-hmm. maybe again he looks at his attacking options and think either i have what i want or there's nothing out there that really is that appetizing to me benny yep. fellhaber again maybe a single tear rolls down his cheek yeah but maybe, i think maybe, maybe that's what it is maybe someone challenged arena like how hard could you troll benny fellhaber this weekend <laughs> And he's like, we'll and he see. executed <laughs> yeah. flawlessly. Yeah, so it might be that like he is a replacement center back. He can come into camp, Beasley. see how sharp yeah. he looks, Beasler. But he also can play at left back if the situation necessitates that move. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about with Bobby Woods' back injury mm-hmm. is I was kind of joking in the intro, but mm-hmm. also what's the phrase you use? Kidding on the square. Yep. Because we've heard a few times from say Gabriel Makati, mm-hmm. the uh, Times journalist, yep. uh, the game uh, podcast host, suggesting that. The go-to injury for players who are faking an injury mm-hmm. to get out of something is lower back pain. Right. Because it can't be tested for and can't right. be proven uh, to exist or not exist. Right. Because essentially it's not like, like for example, John Brooks, if he's complaining of knee pain, they can do that MRI. They can look at it and yeah. say, oh, your meniscus is like slightly swollen, but yeah. it's, it's not a You can a see information. Issue. You can yeah. see, right? With a back, there's so many things that could be wrong mm-hmm. that it's essentially, I guess, impossible to check everything in a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. So it tends to be... The thing that a player who wants a new contract or is frustrated by a situation <laughs> or wants to move or just doesn't like a situation, yeah. well, they'll complain of a bad back. This is what Diego Costa maybe had for a little Diego while Costa, when he was thinking about going to China. Right? And I believe Dimitri Payet as well. I, Dimitri Payet, of course, yeah. the classic example this mm-hmm. year. I think this is where I learned this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think so. So, Are we suggesting that this is what Bobby Wood's doing? No. I mean, because there's no reason. It's not as though he yeah. and, Klinsman, or Klinsman, he and uh, Bruce Arena have like bad mm. blood. That said, I do think that I am maybe inclined to believe in conspiracies more than you. And I do wonder if your and Klinsman were still in charge, if I would be like, huh, what are you doing here, Bobby? What are you doing? Um, but no, I think it's probably, I think it's fueled by the fact that we saw him sub out for Hamburg in like yes. the 90th minute. 91st. There we go. Mm-hmm. Um, and he seemed fine. Yep. There wasn't like a grabbing of the back. There mm-hmm. wasn't like, you, don't, you didn't see him, as far as I could see, you didn't see him like continuously trying to stretch it out and like kind of doing those like moves that you would do when yeah. your back is a little bit sore. I'm doing I'm, them if you're wondering. My, okay. my voice is changing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say maybe if this is a continuing problem, because that's what um, Hamburg yeah. said afterwards, mm-hmm. right? Um, and he aggravated like a, a back injury, which suggests he already had one. Or it was like he, like, but it, see, it was still not that severe. That's where I'm still sort of like yeah. confused about because it was like he he like aggravated a sore back or that something was it. like that. Yeah. It wasn't like a bad back or uh-huh. a, a pulled muscle or anything in, in the back. It was he, he had a sore back and <laughs> it was sore again. But I guess we should be careful with. Um, yeah. Uh, statements from a club in German yep. being translated to I think Very the true. Associated Press mm-hmm. translated it into English and then that mm-hmm. then that gets spread around. Yeah. You got to be careful, right? Mm-hmm. And I think I think if these were international friendlies, if this was January camp or something like that, maybe that's a different story. Mm-hmm. I don't see why there would be any reason for Bobby Wood to feign an injury no. or like. Even if it's a minor injury, miss World Cup qualifiers yeah. for the sake of maybe getting back to fitness and not having a sore back anymore. Because Arena spoken glowingly yeah. of Wood. It looked quite likely that he was going right. to start. Mm-hmm. Um, my guess is the reason he didn't look in pain during the game and when he subbed out is maybe painkilling injections. That could be. Right? Because the news obviously came out after the game, but not mm-hmm. immediately after the game. And my guess maybe is Hamburg put some pressure on him like, don't risk this. You're in form. We don't want to get relegated forever. Like you know, what I mean, mm-hmm. so maybe some pressure came from the club, but I'm just massively speculating. It's probably not a smart thing to be doing. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. So in the end, we can just say that uh, Bobby Wood out 
Fabian Johnson out, Clushton, Zussi, Beasler, all in, and yeah. we don't really, I don't really know how I feel about it. I'll put it that way. Yeah. And at the end of it, it's not like, okay, I can see what we're doing here. I can get a consensus lineup in my head. Mm-hmm. Everything makes sense. I know we'll talk about this later, or yeah. like in the you know next couple of days when we do the, the Big full preview. preview. For the Honduras, yeah. But it's still, it just, I'm still sort of left with that feeling of uncertainty about this roster that I don't necessarily love heading into to need to win mm-hmm. must get points games. Yep. Uh, Matt Doyle called it must win and must result. Yes. Honduras and Panama mm-hmm. respectively, which I think is the the right way to phrase it. Four mm-hmm. point minimum. Yep. Is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, just talking about these, these injuries before we move into our MLS review, um, the one thing I would say is it maybe sets us up to see whether this squad is deep or not. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think Arena talked about this being the, the deepest US pool for a long time, but it's been shown of an informed goal scorer who mm-hmm. was informed in the Bundesliga, really lighting it up, um, an informed wide midfielder in Fabian Johnson. So suddenly you lose two of your likely starters and most effective players, mm-hmm. and then you see whether the guys that step in to replace them, who could be like Darlington Nagby, could be Jordan Morris, we'll see whether those guys are up to the task mm-hmm. and whether the US really is that deep. Yeah, I, I see. I think the difference here is that you're approaching it from this, like they're, I feel like you have this background of they're probably going to get four points, and so it's exciting to see how they're going to make that happen, yeah, yeah. and I don't have that background. You're thinking My, they might not get four points, and this makes it even more I'm likely. slightly concerned. Yeah. yeah, I'm slightly concerned, and maybe that's just paranoia because I've, I'm have i not used to being in this position as a U.S. fan, and so to be back here where it's sort of like, uh-oh, we really got to get results. With zero points in the hex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or just not looking very good, not looking as cohesive as we have in the past. Yeah. It does give me that little bit of concern, and so it makes me less likely to believe, like, oh, great, well, we've got these guys in. How can he perform in this situation? It's more mm-hmm. like, well, he better perform. Otherwise, uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so before we move into mm-hmm. our MLS review, mm-hmm. we should let people know that today's show is sponsored by Fuji, makers of the Engineered Soccer Rebounder. Taylor, would you please explain to our listeners how Fuji works when I beat you at it? <laughs> sure. Uh, when you beat me at it, it's in your fantasy. <laughs> and then in the real world, uh, it's essentially, uh, it's kind of, the best way to characterize it is like half soccer, half squash. Yes. It's basically you uh, you set it up. It takes about 10 minutes. You can watch our instructional video mm-hmm. to set it up if you're so inclined. And then basically it's got that, that net, the rebounder, so you can play, basically play one-on-one if you want to. Yep. So you can improve your skills. Yep. Or you can play against one opponent or a group of opponents. Yep. And it's essentially hit it against the net, ball rebounds, hit Landed it Landed in the court the is yep. the key part. Mm-hmm. If you hit it too hard, it yep. bounces out of the court. It looks impressive for like three quarters of a second, and yep. then you get the sad face. Mm-hmm. When it or you put too much spin on it, it lands on the yep. side. It's it's a whole thing you got to learn how to do it it's really good to work on your touch and it's also good as like a game amongst friends mm-hmm. or a game amongst competitors mm-hmm. which is how we end up doing it yeah it is <laughs> or if you're trying to maybe say improve your skill improve your touch enough so that maybe like a u.s national team manager <laughs> wants to look at you and think yeah you know what i didn't call him last time but next time sure all right so let's do our fuji rebound player of the week sure speaking u.s men's national mm-hmm. team um which player has the best chance of making a rebound um into the u.s national team or or even in terms of rebounding his U.S. national team reputation over the next couple of weeks? I mean, I think it's maybe Benny Failhopper, because if Sasha Kleshton does come into this U.S. team and doesn't impress, yeah. then maybe Benny Failhopper, his stock rises a little bit just by doing nothing, almost. Yeah. And then if he continues to perform the way he has, at least in this last game, and definitely when we saw him for D.C., yeah. then maybe that stock continues to rise. He rebounds significantly, I'd say. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I'm going to then go for something uh, you're not going to expect this. Mm. Maybe the rebound player is Sasha Kleston. Okay. Because we were all kind of down on him mm-hmm. sort of the start of the season. We weren't thrilled when it was Kleston chosen over Fail Harbor for the roster. Mm-hmm. What if, what if Sasha Kleston pulls out some magic in these qualifiers and then we all celebrate it? I mean, it's, it's, it's a decent possibility just because... Because he's mean, got the skills, right? And you look at the New York team right now and they're playing a formation that clearly doesn't suit him. Mm-hmm. They've gotten rid of Dax McCarty, who I think we're realizing was very important to Sasha Kleshton's mm-hmm. game and kind of giving him that confidence to go forward yeah. and Dax McCarty doing that defensive work. Dax McCarty yeah. in this U.S. team. So yeah. maybe you do part of them. Who maybe knows? Maybe McCarty was like the uh, the rat under the chef's hat in Ratatouille. Okay, sure. <laughs> Kleshton's the chef. Whenever I think Pat Oswald, I think Dax McCarty. So sure. <laughs> All right, so those are my picks. Um, mm-hmm. If people want to buy a Fuji Rebounder, where would one do that, Taylor? They can go to... www.playfuji.com. Um, the full link is in the show notes that will take you directly to the product page. Mm-hmm. And then you can get the biggest possible discount on a Fuji Rebounder through the Total Soccer Show. Can't say this very often. We've got the best deal. Yep. How do sure people do. get that deal? They enter uh, the promo code, what, TSS2017 yep. at checkout to get that deal. 
So that's playfuji.com. The full link is in the show notes. TSS 2017 for the best possible discount on a Fuji rebound. Alrighty. Moving on to Major League Soccer, we are going to take a look at Seattle's 3-1 win over New York with an eye, of course, on Deuce and Morris, mm-hmm. uh, fair enough, and Cleshton, kind of, yeah. as much as we can. I think so. <laughs> as much as he was involved. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of a quick U.S. national team roundup, we're going to look at Josie's goal and assist for Toronto against Vancouver. We're going to look at Benny Failharbour's goal, because even though he wasn't in the national team, mm-hmm. two other U.S. national team players were involved in that goal, um, and another U.S. national team player was involved in scoring a goal for Sporting KC. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. He plays for San Jose. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I was confused for a moment. Gotcha. And then then we're going to look at Nagby's role in Portland's 4-2 win over Houston. And then, just because, yep. we're going to look at Atlanta's 4-0 win. Because um, they're good. Over Chicago, yeah. Not because Dax McCarthy was to blame in any way, but because that's kind of the thing people are buzzing about this weekend, right? Yep. It's, a, it's a big, big win for Atlanta. Absolutely. We're going to look at how Joseph Martinez has no time for your offside traps, Major League Soccer. <laughs> he does no, he's not interested in it. Is that what you tweeted? Yeah, he, has, he laughs in the face of your offside There tricks, it is. Which really is what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. So too does Jordan Morris a little bit to go back to the Seattle yes, game. because clever, clever boy, yeah. I, that was one of the things that I enjoyed the most about his performance in this game. In a game where he scored and drew a penalty, it was the fact that he kind of routinely made smart decisions when it came to staying on side. Yes. All right. So, Seattle, New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to start with this. 4-2-2-2. Two, two, two. Yeah. Doesn't work. Does not work? Does not work. At least not in this situation. So New York Rebels once again started with this formation and once again switched halfway through mm-hmm. because it was not working. I'm right. sure New York Rebels fans who had such a great season last season will be tearing their hair out. I think so. I mean, I yeah. think, again, to go back to it, you get rid of Dax McCarty. I think that's a big part of mm-hmm. the problems that you're having here. Yep. And then it just seems like even the little things that this formation is set up to do, if you're in a four two two two, the idea would be that you can have possession and numbers in the middle yep. and move that ball forward. A number of different times, New York would get the ball and bypass Seattle's press a little bit and then turn the ball over because there were no options. No options out wide specifically. Or right? even through the middle. Like, you'd think that if, if, fine, if we don't have options wide, then we're going to have numbers in the middle. We can kind of do like one and two touch passing combinations mm-hmm. and move that ball forward quickly. And just so many times, even if there would be a guy with time, like, keep time on the ball, he'd put his foot on it, look around, and then eventually get knocked yep. off by a Seattle player. Is the thinking maybe that someone like Sasha Kleshton, mm-hmm. like is so good in tight spaces that he can move the ball? I, I maybe that's the thinking. I think maybe it's just that Jesse Marsh has this idea that people can execute the game plan and he mm-hmm. can get the team playing the way they're supposed to be playing, and so he's kind of overlooking obvious problems, like yeah. as you said, the fact that there's no width. And yeah. so then to overcompensate at times, you do have uh, it was Clushton and Royer occasionally drifting wide. Yeah. But then if you're trying to get that kind of numbers in the middle, that defeats the purpose. You also have Shasta Clushton then playing out wide, yeah. which then negates his ability to kind of control the ball and play the balls through and create opportunities. Mm-hmm. It just it felt very disjointed from start to finish. It seemed to me last week New York Red Bull started this with Bradley Wright Phillips mm-hmm. and Derek Etienne Jr. Right. up top. And eventually they ended up uh, drifting or moving Etienne Jr. Mm-hmm. out wide going 4-2-3-1, right? And Clashton could go through the middle again. This week, they tried new loan signing. Is it Gold Branson? Yes. Um, they Norwegian. tried a two, a two player, two striker mm-hmm. system, 4-2-2-2-2. Two, 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 and it, if anything, it looked worse. Yeah. I mean, and especially when you have this kind of like new striker coming in who's supposed to be very exciting. You never want his impact to be no goals, yellow card for diving. Yeah, I forgot And very got, obviously diving at that. It wasn't good, was it? New. Do you think he was just testing the waters? Like, yeah, I'm going to see what these MLS... <laughs> I've heard these MLS refs, so I can get them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> apparently missed the... Uh, or maybe he he had seen the gifts previously of uh, the Portland players diving <laughs> that the like, Galaxy put out. He was like, well, they get those. Maybe I'll get this. He did not. He did he not. He did not. Yeah. Um, and so once again, uh, New York switched later in the mm-hmm. game but it was kind of too late because you've burned half your game then <laughs> right yeah and you're um, already I mean if you're switching in halftime you're already 1-0 down in this case yes alright so Seattle went out in what I want to say is the now classic 4 2 3 one. Roll down sure. and Alonso yep. together. Um, Jordan Morris at the tip, right. the very highest striker. Behind him, Clint Dempsey. Harry Ship to the left. Nicolas Ladero to the mm-hmm. right. That's quite the lineup. Nico Ladero for you, buddy. You what, get the abbreviated one. Nicholas. Oh, so you're saying I know him better? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. I think you guys are on like abbreviated nickname basis. <laughs> okay. I've decided. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Indeed. We've watched him enough. <laughs> 
Uh, should we talk about Jordan Morris's role in the first goal? Yeah. So he wins a penalty kick he by does. essentially being too fast for the human eyes of Luis Robles. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's a way to put it. Why not? <laughs> it's also Seattle doing the press yep. that New York, I think, used to do so effectively. Yes. And it's essentially, it's uh, Nico Ladero. <laughs> Nicholas to you. I'm just sorry you don't know him well enough. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> We're going back to the uh, the Paul F. Tompkins playing Gary Marshall and just rotating back and forth between yeah. please call me Gary and please call me Mr. Marshall. Uh-huh. I'll take that. Um <laughs> Yeah, in this case, it's Nicholas Ladero. Uh, this is where you say call him Nico. Uh, pressuring uh, Perrineau. Deliberately did. <laughs> it's pressuring Perrineau who, like, really, if I didn't know better, would think that maybe he was deputizing as a center back. Because he sort of... No, he's a center back. It seems like he weighs all of the options available to him. It could be try to, like, kind of turn to the outside, play the ball up the line. It could be hoof it into touch. It could be even just play it out for a corner. Yep. And instead he goes through all those and is like, no, no, no. A gentle back pass to my goalkeeper <laughs> that won't ever possibly reach him. Is there any That's chance, the solution. Is there any chance Perrinell's touch was actually an attempt to control it and then pass it? I yeah, feel like he was setting well himself be. up for a firm pass, and that's why it sort of was yeah. a very weak pass to Robles. Yeah, but he, he gets that kind of hassle from Ladero, and that's what mm. makes that weak pass occur. And then it's the read from Jordan Morris. Ladero, very good at pressing, mm-hmm. it turns out. I feel like this is a thing he's not credited with enough. Yep. We saw two or three times in this game, he was very smart with that like, closing down the angles mm-hmm. for New York Rangers. Yeah, exactly. But as you mentioned, the man who reads it, faster than anyone and then runs faster than anyone is young Mr. Jordan Morris because he is on it like a shot on it before Robles can get there Mm -hmm. and I mean and it's really impressive just to see that he's he kind of identifies the situation right away and takes two steps and then is basically at full speed from there on out Mm -hmm. and that's how he's able to close so quickly that's again I mean you made the joke but really I think Robles doesn't see him because he does a good job of disguising that run and then timing it really well so that when Robles like kind of Gets to the ball, he's instead of making contact with the ball, he's making contact with Jordan Morse's plant foot, I Does believe. Does Robles go for like a weird slide tackle? I think Does so. Does he yeah. have time to go down with his hands? No, he? because I think at that point he's realized, well, if he goes down with his hands, it could be a back pass and then yeah. you've got an indirect free kick. And your feet are already closer to the floor? Yeah, right? sure. It's just the last ditch yeah. kind of, here's what we can yeah. do. Yeah, but I think it's probably also the best way. If you're going in like hard on a slide tackle against a player who's coming in at an angle, mm-hmm. maybe the thinking there is that you're gonna, even if you win if you win the ball, it's going far away. Okay, yeah. So, but in this right. situation, it doesn't. Well, what if Robles hadn't fouled Jordan Morris? This mm-hmm. is like a pro con Jordan Morris thing, right? Because mm-hmm. if he hadn't fouled him, I feel like Morris is taking his angle way out wide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he might be, but then at least he's taking it out wide. He's gotten around the goalkeeper, and he can try to yeah. play that ball back across, yeah. or you know, go for the Martinez esque finish. It's from un- a very tight angle. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I guess it's unfair to criticize Morris because it's it's impressive just to get there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. Mr. Clint Dempsey Mm -hmm. steps up to take the penalty kick. Dempsey on the score sheet, um, not for the first time this year in Major League Soccer. Um, I want to say, not just the penalty kick, but his all-round performance, Clint Dempsey, Mm -hmm. does it fill you with more confidence that he might be fit to start or at least play significant minutes against Honduras and or Panama? Uh, Yes, and this is why earlier I said like I was happy at the start of the day because we were watching this game. It Mm -hmm. seemed like Clint Dempsey was back to the kind of sharpness that I didn't think he was at when he was called into the squad. Yeah, that there was lots of decision-making. There was in the 20th minute. He kind of has like a no-look reverse pass into the path of Jordan Morris. I called it In my notes, I called it a spin pass. Yeah. Like he turns yeah. in clips and puts spin on it. Yeah. yeah? But it, and it's, it's, he's reading the defense. He knows where his teammates are. It's that kind of veteran wisdom from Clint Dempsey that I mm-hmm. like to see. The only tiny thing that gave me pause for concern was late in the game. He kind of retaliates against Felipe. Felipe gives him a bump, and he gives him a big old shove that I think he thinks the referee hasn't seen, but mm-hmm. the fourth official did. Yep. Then he kind of mouths off to the, the, the sideline official, gets a yellow card, and that's the only element there. And I know that you could say that that's – you know, old Dempsey being fired up. Yeah, I but, took it as like, oh, he's really back and he's yeah, doing this stuff. But you could also see it as Clint Dempsey <laughs> vulnerable to being concacaf and getting a kick and getting a stamp here yeah. and getting frustrated, giving a shove, getting a yellow card, and suddenly you can't really afford any other like minor indiscretions or it's going to be a red. Because given what he did to Felipe and the mm-hmm. way he shoved him, there is um, an alternate reality that we very could have easily entered mm-hmm. where we're sitting here doing this podcast today and we're talking about Dempsey being sent off yeah. playing for Seattle, yeah. right? That is definitely something that could have happened. I think so. And to the extent that like, like, the referee did not see it. If the referee had seen it, I think there's a chance he does get sent off. Yeah. Because, I mean, and, you know, you could argue it's, uh, oh, it's, you know, the nature of the game. It's a little feisty. There's going to be some shoving. But I think he doesn't get sent off because the referee doesn't see it. And maybe the fourth official says, it's a shove. It's probably a yellow. Mm-hmm. You maybe you don't want to go on the advice there when giving a red card. Or maybe he's thinking, we got that qualifier. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. But kind of, I hope so. Um, so Jordan Morris um, mm-hmm. does get himself on the score sheet he does. Uh, later in the game with a header at the far post. Not something I normally associate with Jordan Morris. 
No. Not I, that he doesn't do it often, but it's yeah. not the foot you normally think of the pace and mm-hmm. the one on one with the keeper. Mm-hmm. Instead he sort of heads home at the far post from a Nico Ladero cross. Yeah. And it's and it's I think to say it's a Nico Ladero cross is to uh to take away a lot of the credit that yeah. goes to Jova Jones. Well, you can't n- you can't head home a nutmeg. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's essentially the ball goes out wide to Jovan Jones. He collects it. I uh, forget who it is. Oh, Celzizo, Celzizo. Who, goes out, who goes out there to try to defend him. And I think basically comes in too fast and kind of out of control. I think Jovan Jones mm-hmm. identifies this possibility that he's not going to be able to kind of correct his positioning yep. to be in good defensive shape. Mm-hmm. And so Jovan Jones puts that ball right through his legs. We've talked in the past about um, people looking at their opponent mm-hmm. to like read what the opponent's doing so you can like react to what their yep. legs do. Jovan Jones in this situation isn't looking at his opponent, isn't looking at the ball, instead is fake looking back mm-hmm. down the field, making Zizzo think he might be playing the ball backwards. Yeah. I'm convinced that that's what persuades Zizzo to just open his legs up just enough to squeeze that ball through. My guess would be that Zizzo doesn't know, or thinks that Jovan Jones doesn't know he's coming. Because yeah. I, I, that's usually when I try to use that move, it's when the, the player I can tell is coming at me You've really... the Jones move? Oh, I've, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's the best move ever because it's so simple, <laughs> but it's, it's just a tap. But if the yeah. player is... Like coming in really, really hard and thinks like, "Ha ha, he has no idea I'm coming. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna poke the ball away. I'm gonna like kind of give him that the body. I'm gonna knock him down, and then you just poke it right past him." Yep, it's it's really easy to do and can make the, them look foolish. And I think it's worth uh, going into this maybe, mm-hmm. especially for people who haven't played soccer and have never had the joy of nutmegging someone. Mm-hmm. The reason it's so great, especially in the situation Jones has done it, and mm-hmm. I say this as someone who doesn't often, I'm, I'm more the nutmeggy than the nutmegger. Mm-hmm. Um, Same the, here. Yeah. The person coming towards you is coming at full pace, mm-hmm. and so you can go even from a standing start. You put it literally through them as if they were a ghost and then you can come around the other side mm-hmm. and they've accelerated in the wrong direction. Right. That's the beauty of it, right? Mm-hmm. Is that you've got them going in the wrong direction so they really can't catch you right. if you do it right. And because you've overcommitted if you're Salzizo at that point, your teammates have all thought, okay, Jovan Jones is facing the other way. Yep. He's going to go lock him down. They're going to have to play that ball back. Mm-hmm. We're good. And so they all relax. They all kind of step out. They're not aware of the fact that there are three players waiting at the back post. And yes. so suddenly when that Meg happens... Jones is in, and he really, yep. I mean, he probably could dribble and shoot, but yeah. I think he, he wisely picks out that that has been cut off now. I think a defender comes across and like closes that I down think Perinelle is bit. the one who drops back yeah. in. But in, in but so that doing. more chaos, right? Because then Perinelle's come out of the middle. Yeah. And he's left Nico Ladero. And so now yes. Nico Ladero's open, that ball can go to Ladero, who can then, I think, one time it back across the goal. It's a yep. really well placed ball to the head of Jordan Morris, who knocks it home. And if I remember, it's Jordan Morris, Flacco, and Dempsey are yep. all there. And there's only, I can't remember who they are, but there's two defenders. That's a mismatch, right? Yeah. One of those guys is going to be free, and Morris is the guy that's free and heads it home. And, and it's and to the point that like the move by Jones throws everybody off. I think Billy, Billy was the left back who Jordan Morris runs around and wins the header over yes. for the goal. I think he has no idea that Jordan Morris is even there. Oh yeah, we replayed this a few yeah. times, right, to see if he glances at mm-hmm. Morris or at someone else, or because yeah. uh, Morris gets behind him, right? Yeah, and he does. But then as soon as that ball goes out wide, he starts to kind of drift away, like, oh, okay, we're mm-hmm. good. And then suddenly is kind of reeling and having to figure out what to do. So this is the theme of the day: um, yeah. New York players not knowing that Jordan Morris is there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then the so I guess so overall a good performance by Jordan Morris gets the yeah. goal draws the penalty but there are those moments yeah. so you've got the ankle injury which he says he's okay yes um, but so it, take him at his word. it gives you a little pause for concern we had a great report from Michael Lazar about yes. about this game where he referred to the awkwardness of the post-match interview mm-hmm. and that in that interview Jordan Morris was like yeah it's okay like <laughs> yeah, I guess kind of didn't want to make a big deal of it didn't want to overstate well I guess we all need um, we all need reassuring after Fabian Johnson yep. and Bobby Wood yep. and like you know what I mean I think mm-hmm. I think we want to make sure that no more strikers or US national team players at all mm-hmm. get injured and so it's and I'm in a strange position of saying that even with the criticisms I had of uh, Clint Dempsey and my con- concerns about how sharp and fit he was coming into this game and the U.S. men's national team camp and how exciting Jordan Morris was in this game, I still think I'd rather see Clint Dempsey start if I had to choose between Clint Dempsey and Jordan Morris. Well, we'll get deep in this on mm-hmm. Wednesday, but I've got to ask you, why Why so? Because I think the defenses in the United States are going to be playing against are going to be very compact. I think, Panama, yeah, yeah, I think they're not going to be playing a high line. There's not going to be that much room to exploit the way mm-hmm. there was in this game, which That's I think suits point. Jordan Morris's style. Yeah. I think you bring him on late New when York he has do. that dynamism and energy. New York go really high, don't they? Mm-hmm. We saw a lot of times that it almost looked too far. They were pushing when they were trying to press. We mm-hmm. saw that back line come up really far. Right. Yeah. And so I think that really benefits Jordan Morris. I don't know if a compact defense that he has to pick his way through does. I mean, because yeah. we saw he had a chip that he maybe could have put on frame, but I think didn't take quite, yeah. like didn't use quite as good technique as maybe he should have. Yeah. Then he had sort of a breakaway, but his first touch wasn't very good. Yeah. Put him under pressure. Then he kind of scuffed the chance. And so it's just those little moments where it's he's not quite at that level yet yep. where you trust him to pick apart a defense and figure things out, whereas maybe you do with Clint Dempsey. 
Okay, all right. So there's your Seattle New York review. Uh, three one to Seattle. New York, go back to the four two three one. Get Sasha Kleston in the middle. Yeah. Yeah? I think so. Let's do that. Maybe sure. bring Dax McCarthy back if you can. <laughs> uh, probably can't. <laughs> I think Dax McCarthy, even if offered, probably wouldn't uh-huh. go back. Can, can we do the buyer's remorse like we talked about with Bruce Arena earlier? Like, if uh, New York keep the receipt. I think, I think Dax McCarthy is having, even, even though he lost 4 0 on the weekend, <laughs> I think still pretty happy with the way things ended up, maybe. All right, other things around the league. Let's mm-hmm. talk about Josie Altador um, for Toronto against Vancouver. Okay, so it's 2 0 to Toronto. It is a Josie Altador assist. It's a nice nodded header across goal right. for Vasquez. And it's a Josie Altador goal that almost, almost fills me with joy because. Okay. One, it's against uh, Kendall Waston, yeah. the giant Kendall Waston. Uh, the, he's, I mean, he's a bad man mm-hmm. as well, right? How many times have we seen him sent off? I mean, w- there, was, there was the red card to Breck Shea in this one, and then there was some bad blood later in the game, where I think it was Kendall Waston holding his entire team back at one yes. point. <laughs> yeah. He's like Hodor, right? Yeah, just, uh, basically. Spoiler alert. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> Josie Altador <laughs> up against... Spoiler alert that Hodor holds things? Yeah. Cool, got it. <laughs> <laughs> Josie Altador, with his back to Kendall Waston, mm-hmm. receives the ball. That is a tough job mm-hmm. in and of itself. This is for his goal, I'm describing. Uh, the pass comes from Osorio. Mm-hmm. What he does next, I think, is what makes it kind of special. He manages to kind of receive and spin and shoot yeah. in like a lot of very quick touches to the point where we were in studio trying to figure out which feet he used, mm-hmm. right? Because it all happened so very quickly. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and, and it might have been a little bit confusing there. It's because... He receives and turns in the same motion. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, it's not even like he receives and then he turns with the ball and somehow beats Kendall Waston. It's that yeah. he knows where he is in relation to the goal. He knows where he is in relation to the defender so that he can open himself up a little bit to have that first touch yeah. to then set himself up to take one more little touch to set up that final finish. It's basically three touches, I think. Yep. That's what ends up uh, putting that ball in the back of the net for Joe's mirror. And you always talk about separation, yep. right? When you've got a big guy and a very good defender, I didn't mean to mm-hmm. disrespect him, he's a very good defender, yeah. Kendall Waston, big Costa Rican defender. Um, Josie's able to turn him or turn away from him and mm-hmm. create just enough separation to get yep. the shot away. Really good work from Josie. Absolutely. I mean, and then, and I think it combines everything we love to see from Josie out there, right? It's yeah. like the physicality, it's, it is the speed, the quickness, that quick acceleration, but mm-hmm. also the technique and the finishing ability. It's everything you want to see in a striker heading into a very important series of games. In which he will start, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it's also that first goal for Toronto, that assist. The Vasquez goal. It's yeah. just a really nice cushioned header back across goal. And it really, I love those types of goals where it's like the cross in and then the headed back and then the put home because mm-hmm. it just kind of covers all that ground. But it really points to Josie Altador not just looking for the goals, but also looking to create goals, not yeah. just kind of selfishly, no matter what, I got to be the one on the score sheet, but picking out his teammates and making things happen. We're 100% convinced it wasn't an attempt at goal that was off yes. target that then Vasquez scores off. Because of the way he heads it, it's, it's very much like that cushion kind of, I'm doing exactly what I want, I'm positioning where I want, it's a very directional yes. header. Yeah, because if you're like going to score from there, you're, you're hitting it as hard as you can. Yeah, right? I think so. Right? Yeah. yeah, there'd be more power on it. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're up on Josie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan Morris got a goal. Clint Dempsey got a goal. Mm-hmm. All the U.S. strikers in the squad got a goal this weekend. But the best goal of all came from a man who did not make the right. roster. It was Benny Fahaba for Sporting KC against San Jose. He used to, if you haven't seen this um, and you did see the 2002 World Cup, yep. here's what happens. <laughs> Benny Fahaba did a Ronaldinho against David Seaman England yeah. type goal yep. against David Bingham. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically gets the ball. Uh, I think fed from Graham Zussi, it's a square ball. I think you tried to give Graham Zussi credit for like a very hey, good assist. Does he get an assist for it or not? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, he can't, MLS can't be. I well, really, the goal was so good, we're not going to give it to I Graham honestly Zussi. don't know if he does. <laughs> he I mean, does. I'm assuming he does, but he didn't really help. Like, it wasn't a critical pass or anything, but yeah, he definitely does. Yeah, I think the critical thing is what they weigh for the, uh, the, for second the secondary assist. assist. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. probably true. But in this situation, uh, Fahlhaber gets the ball, and we looked at this a couple different times. It, he doesn't... It's not as though he sees David Bingham off his line. He doesn't see David Bingham cheating one way or the other. I thought Bingham had cheated yeah. to uh, Bingham's left, Falhaber's yeah. right. And I think it's more that, because that's where he ends up, mm-hmm. right? I think it's more that Falhaber somehow fools him with the shot. I think he thinks it's going to be laces to the near post, and the initial trajectory of the ball makes it seem like it's going to the mm-hmm. near post. And that's why as soon as it's struck by uh, Benny Falhaber, you do see Bingham jump a little bit. He does that kind of like quick yeah. hop to the left, and that's enough to completely put him off. Yeah. Because then, because Falhaber actually took 
took it with his instep, that ball curves all the way back around. It bends hard. Yeah, it bends real, real hard. <laughs> and Bingham kind of like does that hop to the left and then slowly watches it as it hits the back of the net. The other thing on this goal, we talked about the Zuzi assist, mm-hmm. right? The act, I think the ball to Zuzi is from Far Harbor. He does some great work in the middle. He's under pressure. I actually don't know who the two San Jose players are. Uh, I'm looking for it right now because I'm pretty sure, yeah, I've got it written down. It starts with Zuzi. It goes Zuzi, Beasler, Beasler to Benny, Benny back out to Zuzi, Zuzi to Benny, Benny with a finish. Yep. So it's the three U.S. players, or three obvious U.S. players mm-hmm. in the Sporting KC lineup, two of whom made the squad, one of whom didn't, and it's the one that didn't that gets yeah. that goal. Oh, dear, oh, dear. And I'm starting to see why MLS fans were so frustrated about the exclusion of Benny Failhubber for so long. Specifically KC fans. Right? Yeah. Because we saw, in this game, he had so many little moments mm-hmm. of just dancing away from people. Um, even, like, not the goal, but the, the pass before the goal. He yeah. danced away from two midfielders. And, and that's and the, it's, it's the creativity on the ball, but it's the ability to pull players out. As mm-hmm. I said already, I think it's going to be two compact defenses that the United States is going to have to figure out. Yes. Benny Failhubber routinely was pulling somebody out, and he would do this sort of, like, would turn and pull the defender towards him, and then in the same motion of turning would play it with, like, the outside of his foot back where his player was and yeah. now the defender had stepped out a yard or two yeah, that so was Benny all that shuffle. was needed yeah, I love that the Benny shuffle that's what we're calling <laughs> it from now on because he does that routinely it's that little flick with the outside of the foot it's the kind of push pass with the outside of the foot mm-hmm. that is a very intentional disguised pass yep. and it's just little moments like that that I found very impressive and then obviously the goal it makes you wonder why maybe Benny didn't get called in yeah so I think you were right to make him your Fuji bounce back player we yeah. may see him um, on the roster in the future I feel like if there's one more midfielder injury he's got to be next on the list yeah. right? I mean I know Bruce Arena likes him so I think maybe for some reason he's unlucky Arena trusts Cleshton more mm-hmm. the guy who did make it Graham Zuzi. Yeah. Here's the good news. Yeah. Um, this is the best we've seen Graham Zuzi play at right back agree. this mm-hmm. season. Yeah. Right? The previous two games, there was far too much head down, looking at his feet, not being able to get it out. He still did that a couple of times, mm-hmm. but he just looked a lot more sort of um, – a lot more part of the attack, and there's a bit more space for him to work in, I think, this game. Yeah, I think you, you saw him continue to do decent defensive work. Yeah. Um, I, the goal in the 91st, I think, from San Jose, not really uh, uh, Graham Zussi to blame for that one. Um, but you saw him in the attack, first of all, spreading the field and being far forward, but you saw him coming inside and then leaving space for somebody else to occupy. Yep. And it was nice to see Graham Zussi yeah, still yeah. doing his decent attacking play, doing a little bit better with his service, still maybe putting his head down at times, maybe still not kind of picking his head up and reading things the way we would like. Yep. But overall, it was a better performance. Cha- again, Zuzi's in his 30s. That's not changing. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one's going to send him back to coaching well, well, wasn't that the one that you were – when you were like, Graham, pay attention. Like, there was like he had the shooting yeah. opportunity, but he's looking at the goalkeeper and not paying attention to the players who are closing him down yeah. and end up poking the ball away. He looks at the keeper, looks at the ball, looks at the yeah. keeper, looks at the ball, looks down again, the ball's gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be worse. You could be David Bingham. Yeah, okay. I, I was almost hoping we didn't have to talk about this. Oh, we have but, to talk about this. Um, just to give you the set of... Because it's, it's going to be... I'm just going to add this preamble. It is going to be on like every worst goalkeeper moments. Blue it is, isn't it? Okay, yep. so Taylor saw this long before I did. Mm-hmm. He showed it to me when we came into the studio. Mm-hmm. And I think you said, like, there's no way I can overhype this. Yeah. This is going to look bad. And then you said it's even worse than I expected <laughs> when you watched it live. Or when you watched it live to you. Yeah, live to me, yeah. yeah. If you uh, haven't seen alive. it, it's new to you. I, I think, yeah. 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 So it's what? It's a Sunni Saad. Um, yep. Sporting KC player came off the bench. Yeah. Um, kind of a weakest shot. It takes a deflection. I, pff, not even kind of. A weak shot. It takes a deflection. It's slow rolling and it's off target. Yeah. Yeah. And how does somehow David Bingham goes to scoop it up but redirects it into his own net and the ball was originally going wide? Yeah. The only thing I can think is that he tries to do that sort of. It doesn't make sense because they're losing, but it's like the time wasting. The goalkeeper kind of dives when he doesn't need to, and then like lays on the ball for a second. And he does that kind of extended scoop, and in in so doing, misses the ball. It hits off his left, the inside of his left foot, and slowly, insultingly, rolls into the goal. Yeah, it's tough, right? Yeah, maybe it's the reverse of you. You said maybe he's trying to pick it up quickly and distribute it so uh, mm-hmm. San Jose can get going. Yeah, again, right. Either way. Didn't fill me with confidence that he's our third choice goalkeeper. No. So yeah, just to, in case anyone didn't know this, Brad Guzan um, has dropped out of the squad. Mm-hmm. He and his wife expecting their second child. I went and double checked mm-hmm. uh, after uh, miscommunication on the last show. Um, David Bingham has been called in as the third choice U.S. national team mm-hmm. keeper. Very unlikely that he sees the field. Yep. I would say even more unlikely after this performance. Yeah, maybe maybe Bruce Arena just got his notes confused and thought that like Benny Failhopper directly contributed <laughs> to an own goal as opposed to a goal for his team. Who knows? Yeah. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Yes. So, but, you know, maybe David will redeem himself in camp and things will be just fine. But that yeah. was, 
If you haven't seen it, it was a hilariously bad own goal. Yeah, it made me feel bad for him. Maybe, Maybe not for San Jose fans, but for, <laughs> for everyone else watching, it was sort of a, oh no, sort of moment. It was a gasp. It was a gasp inducing. Okay, shall we move to Portland? Sure. Right, it was Portland Timbers 4, um, Houston Dynamo 2. We don't have time to go through all the goals Mm-mm. except to say, oh my, Fernando Addy, oh my. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> the guy we were most interested in is Darlington Nagbin. That is true. He gets the one assist mm-hmm. for his, like, sweep the leg karate kid assist mm-hmm. <laughs> to yep. Um But I think it was his overall sort of general uh, Darlington Nagbin-esque game that I mm-hmm. think I'm... I feel like I'm in danger of being a broken record and always banging on about this, about how I, I like the way he keeps the ball moving. Yeah, and, uh, and I want to say, you're the one who pointed this out to me, and I hadn't really noticed it before, or maybe I had. We talked about it, and it's been a while. Who knows? <laughs> but there's a drill you do when you're coaching like young players, and you have to teach them that one of the hardest things to get kids to do is to move. That There's this idea that they play this great pass, and then they stand there and watch their pass. Yes. And they just watch, and they're like, yes, I did it. Yep. And you have to teach them, and a drill you do is follow your pass. Yep. You pass the ball, you move to that cone, the person who receives that ball turns, they play to somebody else, they follow their pass, mm-hmm. and it teaches you that you've always got to be moving. Darlington Nagby. Why have you always got to be moving? I feel be, like it's worth underlining this. Because you've got to support your teammate, but you've also got to move to pull people out of position. You're mm-hmm. taking a defender with you, you're creating space in behind that could be occupied by somebody yep. else, but you're also creating numerical advantages yep. for your team. You can get two on ones, three on ones if you keep moving. And how many times, even for the US, have you seen Darlington Nagby be involved in like a really fast yep. exchange of passes? Mm-hmm. The reason that that happens is because he follows his pass and he's there to either receive it again or to pull out somebody else who would have been sort of been able to yeah. defend. He took that drill to heart is what I've clearly <laughs> learned. And I want to say even... These coaches were like, Darlington, you're doing it too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. But even so, I can't remember if it was Nagby or Bradley or both, but there was a game that we saw where, like, I think it was Nagby played the ball wide and the player wide played the ball back to Nagby and Nagby continued to play it back to him. And it then was they did Nagby it. and Vitas. Yeah, and they kept they doing it. And I think Not this game, your joke at the time was like, no, you take the ball. Like yeah. Nagby was trying to get that point across. But in actuality, I think what he was doing was if you're, the, if you're Nagby and you dribble, you can be closed down. Somebody else can step to that player. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden, you've, you've, you're marked out and you've kind of negated that space. Yeah. Nagby playing that ball to Vitas, it pulls defenders out of position because now they've got a mark but because the ball's in motion they can't just come body Nagby off the ball yep. they've got to move with it they've got to adjust and again that allows space in behind that's what Nagby is so adept at doing and it's really I very much appreciate you pointing it out because it's not something I'd really been able to like notice specifically until this game okay yeah. so and here's the other thing the reason that I wasn't mm-hmm. too down on the Fabian Johnson injury mm-hmm. right is that it means probably Nagby gets to start at left mid. Mm-hmm. Not pro- I mean, I'm not... St- the, the US lineup is all up in the air, right? And we'll go through it all on yeah. Wednesday. But there's more of a chance of Darlington Nagby starting in his Portland position for the US national team now that Fabian Johnson isn't already occupying that spot. Mm-hmm. And I think I've said this before. Johnson probably is the superior player, mm-hmm. but I just enjoy the way Nagby plays. So I'm excited to get to see that in a crucial US national team game. I agree. Yeah, I think it, it'll be nice to see Darlington Nagby starting in a crucial game, performing a crucial role. Yeah. Like clearly having a lot of responsibility on his shoulders, and it will be interesting to see how he responds. Okay, a couple more. I'm going to say there's three more. By the way, we've now guaranteed he will not start, so that's great. <laughs> we've, mm-hmm. we've jinxed You're welcome, right. Portland The TSS jinx, sorry, Darlington. Um, so we um, maybe should look at three other players that were involved here, sure. all for Houston. Um, the first Portland goal, I yep. believe, comes from DeMarcus Beasley playing left back yeah. for Houston and handballing in the box to give yeah. away a penalty. And I'm going to call this... Rightly or wrongly, I'm going to call this he pulls a Yedlin because he does that. He's trying, to, he's trying to defend a cross, and he does so by jumping up in the air and turning and looking away and mm-hmm. raising his arms. That's like the recipe for disaster because now you're yep. not tracking the ball. Um, maybe Diego Chara learns from this, and that's why he concedes a handball later on because <laughs> when you jump and you look away and you put your arms up, you have no idea where the ball is going. And even if you don't mean to, your hands, by being up, are in an unnatural position. Yep. You're going to concede a penalty, and that's just what DeMarcus does. Oh, dear. He also looked um, overmatched for pace the, the very many times that Alvis Powell decided to overlap mm-hmm. him, right? Yeah, he overlapped and overran DeMarcus Beasley a couple times. And then he had the misfortune very late in the game DMV. of having to go one-on-one in a like 50-50 situation with Fernando Adi. Yes. That well, was ugly. To be fair, there's not many people can do that. Maybe no. Kendall Waston could do that. Maybe Andre the Giant. But like, <laughs> but, like but, but it was it was just sort of a reminder of like, oh yeah, he's small. Yep. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and so it does make me wonder if maybe just maybe Bruce Arena was considering starting to Marcus Beasley and watched this game and thought, ooh, maybe not. Maybe against physical defenses. <laughs> Maybe I want to put somebody in. Maybe against counter-attacking defenses, I want to put somebody in. Yeah. Just have that extra assurance there in case. And maybe that's why 
uh, you get Matt Beasler in there. Not that Matt Beasler is known for being particularly fleet of foot. Not saying he's slow. Uh, not saying he's DeAndre Edlin. But he's maybe maybe it just gave Bruce pause for concern. And we'd speculated before that maybe one of the reasons Beasley is in this squad, or mm-hmm. at least one of the upsides of having Beasley in the squad, is that he has three Honduran teammates yep. on that Houston team. That he does. Um, two of them combined for a goal. So yeah. um, it's Kyoto is number 12, uh, left winger for Houston, right footed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Elise, I can't remember his number, but he plays right wing yep. for Houston. They combined for one of Houston's goals. And it was a reminder of how dangerous they can be. Mm-hmm. And it was a reminder how you've got to keep that like defense tight and alert because Portland mm-hmm. got a little bit stretched. Their defense got a little bit makeshift for this one sequence. Mm-hmm. And you basically had people out of position. You had people sucked out. And because of that, you had opportunities. And that's exactly what happens. You have that ball in from at least to Kyoto. And Kyoto is basically running down that left channel kind of unmarked. No one's really paying attention to him. And that's mm-hmm. why he's kind of able to ghost in, put that ball in. And, and I think equalize, then Houston take the lead. Yep. Then Portland come back and take the lead. Emphatically. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so my one scouting note, we'll mm-hmm. do more Honduras scouting yep. ahead of our big preview show on, I want to say, Wednesday. Yeah. Um, Kyoto, if he plays on the left, right-footed. Mm-hmm. That's kind of interesting to me, yep. right-footed left winger, because it's always like a weird problem that is then posed, yep. especially when you're going to have maybe someone like Jeff Cameron playing slightly out of position at right back. Actually, that – I hadn't thought about that. That actually makes me feel better. Does because it? Typically, traditionally, if you have uh, that like that left-sided attacker who is trying to create opportunities, if they are left-footed, they're okay with maybe coming inside and trying to get a shot, but they're also okay with using pace to get to the touchline and come inside or using pace to get to the touchline and then play that ball across with their left foot. If you've got Kyoto who prefers his right foot, yeah. then maybe you don't have to worry so much about that pace because, about the he's, because his natural inclination is going to be to then cut back and then play it across with his right foot. Yeah. So if Cameron can keep good position, that kind of negates that threat a Try little bit. keep forcing him outside, forcing him outside. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, should, we should just say that we haven't fully researched Honduras yet, so we don't know if Kyoto is always the starting yep. left winger, mm-hmm. but he's definitely an option. As Bruce Arena would say, he's certainly an option. There we are. <laughs> if Bruce well, Arena managed Honduras. said, buddy. <laughs> Okay, final game uh, Mm -hmm. that I want to talk about today has nothing to do with the U.S. national team, I don't think, because Greg Garza was not selected. Yeah. But Atlanta did win 4-0 against Chicago Fire, and it just feels like kind of a moment, right? It feels like a moment where Atlanta became this thing of everyone suddenly being like, oh... Yep. (laughs) We've got to watch out for these guys. Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, and I think it doesn't doesn't necessarily hurt that uh, Chicago had a player sent off in the 11th minute, I think. Um, And then that's when most of the goals... Most of the goals don't come until, like, the 60th minute and after. Right. So, yeah, you could say, yeah, Atlanta won 4-0, but only because Chicago had a defender. I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. Who was the defender? Uh, Kapiloff. Only because Kapiloff was sent off, but Mm -hmm. he was sent off because of Atlanta's attacking, right? They got him sent off. Yeah, I mean, you know and even saying? before that, they're already up 1-0. It's a, it's a Brandon Vincent own goal. Oh, yeah. Not much that he could do about it. I think Gressel plays that ball in, uh, gets it from Vialba, and then plays it in. It goes yeah. off of Brandon Vincent, who I think really couldn't do much. And that's what puts it 1-0. Then the red, red card happens for denial of goal-scoring opportunity. And then Atlanta do some passing. Oh, yeah. So the stats you gave me, uh-huh. which I'm going to assume are correct, are Atlanta played 935 passes. Is that completed passes? I don't know. Maybe but attempted. I know it's a lot of passes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, to Chicago's mm-hmm. 192. Atlanta's possession stats, yep. 82.9%. This is Argentina-Bolivia numbers yes. from the Copa. Yeah. These and, are big, big numbers. And I, I non-jokingly said... They look like Barcelona mm-hmm. for long periods where Chicago would just bunk it in and Atlanta were content to just move the ball around at the top of the box and just work an opening. But in this way that didn't look desperate, it looked confident. Yeah. It looked like they were toying with them. Yeah. That, it, it, that looked, the whole it, it looked like a team that, number one, has gelled. I'll say that much. Yeah. Number two was extremely confident in their technical ability and I would say their technical superiority just because when you made that comment about like they look like Barcelona Mm -hmm. it was at a time when it was all one and two touch passing in traffic under pressure that it was like somebody settling a ball with a person at their back laying it off that person would then switch it to the other side of the field that player would then one touch it back Mm -hmm. and it was just such quick passing and moving that really showcased it and then unfortunately Michael Parkhurst really emphasized it, which I think your joke was like, and then maybe Michael Parkhurst isn't really familiar with the Barcelona <laughs> he's system. The one not Catalan. Yeah, because his like, first touch in that sequence was maybe 10 yards ahead of him, and I don't think <laughs> yeah. he meant for that to be well, the Chicago case. Chicago was so bunkered that yeah. there was no one to even step and take mm-hmm. the ball. My other note from this game was that um, Joseph Martinez laughs in the face of your offside track yeah. at MLS. I, yeah. that, I, I tweeted that. And I think we said it already on the show as well. Oh, did we? I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> it's been a long day. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about how they did that then. Sure. 
because um, I kind of want to. I want to credit Martinez. Mm-hmm. I want to credit Almiron and um, Assad, the two mm-hmm. guys who played the through balls for Martinez's two goals. But we kind of also have to blame um, Campbell, yeah. the Chicago Fire defender, who comes in and is a little overawed. Well, let's start with well, yeah, Jonathan Campbell. You you're the one who pointed this out, and I think this always goes back in my mind to you being a center back, and you have certain that you have a lot of sympathy for center backs. Yeah. I think, yeah, but yeah. I think you also. Refuse to tolerate certain mistakes from center backs. <laughs> okay. One of which is, if you had that clear, clearing header weekly, unacceptable. Yes. Okay, yeah. so this is the goal where Almiron plays through Martinez. Yep. Martinez skips around the mm-hmm. goalkeeper and scores. Yeah, this all starts with Campbell, heads it. He's got a free header, essentially. A free defensive header because it's from a long ball. To be fair, he is, like, I think he's adjusting. I think he might be backpedaling and then moving forward to meet it. But even so, as I recall, he doesn't have much pressure around him. Yeah. So he should be putting this ball very much away. You've got to clear a couple people mm-hmm. when you play a defensive header. You need to ideally get it out of bounds or to a yeah. teammate. You don't head it directly to a Paraguayan playmaker. And certainly not low and driven to his feet. Yeah. It felt no, like... just, to be fair, okay. you have to chest it down. Okay. Well, still. then at least that's a little something. But really, <laughs> yeah, you got to at least put that over his head, not mm-hmm. to his chest. And then what you don't do is panic and run backwards, which yeah. is the other thing that Campbell does here. And then if you panic and run backwards with Joseph Martinez, yeah. what you don't do is then step up for offside after Almiron has played the through ball. The, yeah. After the pass, you don't step up for offside. This is the first of two different movie references to come. This, this one is, uh, it reminds me, Albert, uh, former co-host Albert Otati was always fond of the Ricky Bobby line from Talladega Nights. This yeah. is not good. I'm flying through the air right now. <laughs> that is what this moment is for Campbell, where it's he's like running backwards. He's like, I got him. I got him. And then looks around and realizes that no one else is around. He's like, oh, I'll stop. And then he stops. <laughs> and it's a little bit late because that ball's already been played. And then Joseph Martinez is through. Yes, yeah. yes. My second movie reference I have to mention well, first, let's talk about Martinez some more because he has the fourth goal, I believe it is, yeah. which is just ridiculous. Is this the from the angle goal? Yes. From the Assad assist? Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a, Assad with another great ball. Again, Martinez with a really smart run. Takes it around. Really, like I think the but commentators... Again, plays the offside trap yeah. perfectly. He times his run. It's Campbell and I think and Brandon mm-hmm. Vincent are both playing him on. I think not a coincidence that those are the two least lesser experienced players. Yeah. Not just MLS experience, but total mm-hmm. soccer experience. Yep. Yeah, and, and Martinez exploits it. And he does. And then I think the commentators said... Oh, it's a good first touch. In, reaction, in actuality, I think because he's moving so quickly and trying to be the goalkeeper to the ball, it's a bit of a heavy touch. It takes him all the way to the end line. And he has no business being able to finish this ball. But he hits it really Far well. Far side netting, right? Far side netting. I think kind of like with the laces outside of his left foot. So it puts that spin on it. And that's how it's oh, able to it go. Oh, then it bends in. inwards. Yeah. Even if he miss hits it, it at least yeah. knows it's going on target and not bending away. Exactly. Clever, clever. Yeah. yeah. And this is where my second movie reference comes in. Okay. I think, I forget what movie it was. Of I think it was Gerard Butler. Uh, but one reviewer, I think, of the comment was the most compelling drama in this movie was watching Jared Butler struggle to contain his Scottish accent. <laughs> and I really love this game for the commentators really, really, really trying not to be super hyped about Atlanta. And it yeah. starts with Kapilov where he gets that red card. And they're all sort of like, oh, that's, you know, that's not denial of goal scoring opportunity. Like, that's ridiculous. It was. He pulls the guy down. It's the last defender. That guy's <laughs> in on goal. It's Martinez who's probably going to score. Yeah. And from there, it just becomes like, so tell me how good this Atlanta team is, do you think? And it was yeah. just a lot of, the last 30 minutes or so were a lot of conversations about about, hyped. Like, yeah, do, like, do you think this is a Supporter Shield winning caliber team? Do you think the Red Bulls fans like should be scared? It was a lot of sort of very leading questions. The jury, uh, the defense would object is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're not going to have that conversation no. because three mm-hmm. games in, it's too early. Yeah. It really is, yeah. right? Because mm-hmm. we haven't seen, even seen Andrew Carlton take the field yet. And I'm not sure gonna, we will, and based on these the performances, Mexico. yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I have to say, I've really... This Atlanta team is so much fun to watch mm-hmm. that I kind of do have them as like appointment television. That yeah, it's, they I, really, if they've got the front four playing, it's worth tuning in just to see what they're going to do next. I am excited to see Atlanta supporter show winning team right here. <laughs> I'm excited to see Atlanta Portland. I think actually yeah. after we finish recording, the next thing I'll do is scan the schedule to see when that game is happening because that's two high pressing teams oh who know how to move the ball. Mm-hmm. But both have deadly goal scorers, one in Adi, one in Martinez. Mm-hmm. That could be that could be a really great game to watch. My word, that's going to be an exciting game. Indeed. I'm very excited. <laughs> okay. We'll be back on Wednesday with our full preview of the U.S. game against Honduras. Mm -hmm. To close today's show, we have a trip to the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. Shall we go to the Total Soccer Show Network first, or shall we go second and go to England first? It's up to you, my friend. You want to go to England for West Brom Arsenal? Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
so so so yep. um, TSS listeners um, Ira and Isaac Jersey yeah. were at the West Brom Arsenal game Isaac was a mascot he walked out with Salomon Rondon and you know what Daryl Salomon that? Rondon Get your act together. Get out of, out of that tunnel faster. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. so the highlights we saw, we couldn't catch it. We no. couldn't catch it because they cut away because Rondon was... And I, could, I think a couple of the West Brom yeah. players were slow coming out of the tunnel. Mm-hmm. Ira and Isaac, let us know. Like, was, was he delayed or was it just happened that he was a bit of a bit of a slow walker? Yep, but we got to see some footage Ira shot of Isaac like, warming up yeah. on, on the field, which is pretty cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I'm sure they were pretty pleased given that uh, I'm guessing they were backing West Brom in this game. I don't, actually, I don't know who they support. But oh, I guess they would have been in the West Brom home section. Yeah. Yeah. West Brom won 3-1 mm-hmm. against Arsenal, which actually, as a Wolves fan, underlines just how far behind West Brom we've fallen. Mm-hmm. It used to be level pegging. Uh, we had um, our predictions for this game. Yeah. Mine was that West Brom would score via a Salomon Rondon header. Didn't happen. Did he not. was present. He did not get his head to any of the balls that resulted he was, in he was present. West Brom goals. I think he was subbed out after the between the first and second goals. Yeah. So he yeah. was replaced by Hal Robson Carnu, uh-huh. who did score. And I'm so bitter because just from uh, Euro, like the Euros this past Euros, I have. A lot of love in my heart for, for Robson Kanu. <laughs> and I was about to predict that he'd score, but I was like, I have no reason for doing that. Yeah. That doesn't inform this game at all. I should pick something that's actually going to happen, which involved, for me, Olivier Giroud coming in and scoring. That's yeah. what I thought. Olivier Giroud would come in. My prediction, I think, was that he would score after the 65th minute. Mm-hmm. He came in in the 65th minute. No goals for Olivier. Oh, so we, yes. both, we both backed a uh, failed target, man, mm-hmm. is what yeah. happened. Do and instead, how Robson Kanu came in and scored. Do you know who did Wait. get their prediction right? Who's that? Isaac. That's right, he did. He predicted Arsenal would take five shots from outside of the box. Yep. I, I believe, I'm guessing, as a result of uh, West Brom's defending. Yep. And exactly that mm-hmm. happened. All right. If I want to claim some credit, I would say at least two of the West Brom goals came from headers. So they, <laughs> that was like the approach. You're right, that's the same Arsenal. thing. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I mean, to be fair, Sol Miranda was subbed out. And so then maybe somebody else came in and had the header <laughs> that led to the goal. I know how you worked, Daryl. Right, yeah, okay, I want credit for that. Then. No. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> um, not. We should mention two other things in this game with mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the flyover the yeah, Arsenal the um, double flyover yeah one in support of Arsene Wenger mm-hmm. one against at time of recording I am thoroughly confused yep. about this Arsenal Arsene Wenger situation mm-hmm. I keep seeing that he's going to sign a two year contract and then I see that he's going to step down I don't know what I the see they've is. approached Thomas Tuchel that's been reported yeah, yeah it's like Bild who are not always the most trustworthy that's he's, very true are very tabloidy that's very true yeah. it seems as though they were w- but start the Christian politics to Arsenal rumours now yeah why not yeah sounds good <laughs> sounds good uh, I, it seems like he's going to sign a two year deal that's seems to be the most consistent, commonly reported threat at present. I'll do you a deal. Um, you listen to Goalmouth uh-huh. uh, Tuesday morning. We'll see if I've got the news by the time I record Goalmouth. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shall we move on then to the Total Sock Show Scouting Network? Let's do. First on my list here, I see Michael Lazar's report on Jordan Morris, which mm-hmm. I believe we've already addressed. Yeah, so we thank have. you, Michael, for that scouting report. Second on the list is Alex Brew, who is scouting Davy Selke, the 22-year-old German striker for RB Leipzig. Lovers of the four two two two. Alex says Selke came off the bench in the fifty sixth minute in an effort to bring Leipzig back into the game, but Werder Bremen scored two second half goals to win three nil. The loss leaves RBL eleven points out of first. Remember when it was a title race? Yep. But more importantly, brings <laughs> Dortmund and Hoffenheim closer to them. Dortmund are now three points behind Leipzig in third, and Hoffenheim are now four points behind in fourth. So we've got a bonus Bundesliga update there. Mm-hmm. This is also very important because uh, Bundesliga have the three automatic qualification spots. Similar For the Champions League. Yeah. yeah, so you definitely want to finish in the top three spots. I see, I see. If you can't knock off Bayern Munich, which right. it seems like no one can. I feel like Bundesliga Dortmund are going to win the Champions League, so they'll just they'll qualify that way. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. That works for me. <laughs> uh, up next, Olaf Danelius, scouting Erdal Rakip, the 21-year-old Swedish midfielder for Malmo. Uh, the offseason, says Olaf, uh, in Malmo, saw two major changes. The first was the controversial firing of their head coach despite winning the league title last season. Do better. Do, you got to do better than winning the league title. Yeah, somehow. Um, Magnus uh, Persson has since taken over and has started Rakip in every preseason game. The other change Olaf mentioned was that uh, Enoch Kofi Adu, who often kept Rakip out of the first team last season, moved to Akisar Beladiaspor. Ooh, I should have got that first time. Yeah. Uh, in the January window. That is a Turkish club, so I should have known. <laughs> uh, that means that Rakip is a certain starter for the league opener on April 1st. When Mama will face Mix Diskarud and IFK Gothenburg in the Swedish Classic. I forgot that Mix Diskarud. Yep. There's a chance he comes back in form, comes back to the US national team, right? Sure. <laughs> I wouldn't put it this way. I would not name him my Fuji rebounder. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Okay, up next, I think I did at one point. Um, up next, Elizabeth Jolly and oh, Alex no. Barone are scouting Kylian Mbappe, the 18-year-old French striker for AS Monaco. 
I'm quite proud of us getting him in the scouting network before he hit it big. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. But this Man City game, his profile went way, way up. Mm-hmm. He was in there earlier. Okay. Um, Elizabeth and Alex say, Killian scored against Man City in that 3-1 victory last week and then got a brace this weekend at Cain. Uh, Monaco won 3-0, thereby retaining their three-point lead atop League 1. That means Mbappe now has 13 goals in his last 12 matches. As a result, he got his first call-up to the senior French national team, or, quote, Big France, <laughs> including yeah. Temu Bakayoko, who was included as a replacement for Paul Pogba. Yeah. Pogba injured? I think there's an edit there. I apologize. I was supposed to say that Mbappe is one of five Monaco players caught up to uh, Big France for the first time. <laughs> uh, or maybe not for the first time, but five players called up, including Timo Bakayoku. Okay. Yeah, Paul Pogba injured, did not play this weekend for Man United. I see, I see. And I'll add that uh, uh, Elizabeth, who I sent in this, who sent in this report, added that there were Man United scouts in attendance and that their theory, their hope, is that United signed him and then loaned him to Wolverhampton. And thus both of us are happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take that. I would take that too, I think. Who's next? Uh, next is Russell Varner scouting uh, Hugo, Hugo Ariano. I'm going to say that's how you pronounce that. Hugo? Yeah, yeah sure. Right. The 19-year-old American defender for the LA Galaxy. Ariano was named uh, again to the bench on Saturday, but did not see any playing time in the Galaxy's 2-1 win over Real Salt Lake. Things seemed pretty quiet on the Ariano front, apart from him occasionally retweeting something about his beloved Real Madrid. That's a, <laughs> It's weird that he's tweeting about the Galacticos, but not able to play for the Galaxy. Aww. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Andrew Baird is scouting Josh Perez, the 19-year-old American winger slash striker slash attacking genius for Fiorentina. Hype train, hype mm-hmm. train. Um, Andrew says, in an interview with Be In Sports, Perez confirmed his commitment to the U.S. national team, stating that he was looking forward to playing with the senior team, team and hopefully making it to a World Cup. Not the World Cup, mm-hmm. a World Cup. Here's an editorial note, Daryl Grove, just so you know. In Continue. addition, we at TSS, that's us. <laughs> yeah. I didn't write this. I'm just hoping that he makes the U20 World Cup squad. I'm pretty, pretty sure you agree with that statement. Yeah, I'd, well, yeah, there's, there's an element of, like, the guys who won the CONCACAF U20 Championship mm-hmm. kind of deserve their moment. So, like, if Josh Perez makes it, maybe Jonathan Lewis, the mm-hmm. left winger, doesn't make it. True. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. On the other hand, Josh Perez, every time we see him, looks incredible. So yep. it'd be really exciting to see him sort of attacking uh, fullbacks mm-hmm. yeah. in a U.S. national team shirt. Worth underlining, he is, what, the nephew of Hugo Perez, which means he also um, has eligibility for El Salvador. Mm-hmm. Hence the, the comment about sort of reaffirming his commitment to yeah. the United States. I've also just realized something else insane about this upcoming uh, U20 World Cup. Starts in May, by the way. Yeah, there's a, There's... A belief that Cameron Carter Vickers could make that squad, right? Yeah. That would be his second U20 World Cup, wouldn't yeah. it? Wow. He's young <laughs> and good. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Cameron Carter Vickers, young and good. That's what I'm paid for. <laughs> so I get the big bucks. And we'll probably play a defensive midfield. All right. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> to funny. Michael, to Alex, to Olaf, to Elizabeth, and Alex, and Russell, and Andrew for the scouting reports. Mm-hmm. If you would like to join the TSS Scouting Network, you can do so at Total Soccer Show dot com slash subscribe the link will be in the show notes if you want to click on it and see what the scout network is all about and how it supports the show taylor rockwell thank you for taking the time to talk to me today right there got you buddy listeners thank you for listening we'll be back again on wednesday with our big usa versus honduras world cup qualifier preview 